What's up everybody, Greg and Ryan here, and we are jumping into the penultimate episode of Castle Rock Season 2. We're gonna break down the plot, talk about some Easter eggs and mm -hmm. theories going into the final episode. Let's do this, this is episode nine, Caveat Emptor. Caveat emptor is a Latin phrase that means let the buyer beware. Pop previously referenced the principle when describing his shop, the Emporium Galorium, while delivering his own eulogy in episode four. Also a nod to King's novella, The Sun Dog. This episode opens on the 400th anniversary parade, last seen in episode seven. Pop's running away and the very next scene, he's running back to his office where he's looking at those letters that Ward and Lacey gave to Alan Pangborn. Right, this episode starts with a bit of a flashback. Mm -hmm. The parade happened in episode seven. We're at episode nine and- Giving you know, us some context. In a sense, I think that, you know, overall I think this is an excellent episode. I think it's my favorite of this season, honestly. I also feel like pacing wise, like that jump back almost makes me feel like this was maybe better in like a binging Mm -hmm. way of watching it instead of like a week over a week kind yeah. of a thing. It's like, this is like, we're taking a step back. And that episode last week was like, it was short mm -hmm. and I don't want to call it filler. I mean, it, it advanced the plot, but the these three episodes in a row are a pretty tight functioning, yeah. like plot thing. In the letters, we see drawings of the cage, the kid, just like we saw the paintings of the kid back in season one. He's really somebody that inspires people to paint or draw, which has got to be a positive, right? Why is he doing it? How bad is he? He brings <laughs> crops and art. He's the devil. And eventually a, a cure for Alzheimer's. We'll see. Who's that? My client. We asked the question last week, what's Pop been up to? Mm -hmm. This is what Pop's been up to. He's figuring it out yep. and <laughs> made a joke about taping shotguns together, but- That's what he's doing. That's basically what's going on. So next we go over to Warden Lacey's widow, Martha. It's appropriate, I think, that for the very next scene after those letters. It's supported by the rest of the episode, mm -hmm. but I didn't think we were gonna be going there at all. <laughs> Basically, Martha has been resurrected by the goo cult, mm -hmm. and because the people who are resurrected by the goo cult still have access to the memories of their hosts, they're hoping that Martha has some clues as to the whereabouts of the kid because Warden Lacey was obsessed. Unfortunately, Martha doesn't actually have any knowledge except that she knew that there was correspondence between Warden Lacey and Alan Pangborn, which we learned way earlier in the season, mm -hmm. is in the hands of Pop Merrill at the Emporium Galorium. And what did they call Pop? The Collector, which, I don't know, I guess if they don't have pawn shops in the 17th century, then they need yeah. to call somebody who hoards junk something. <laughs> Collector seems oddly <laughs> benevolent, but okay. We also learn here that there is a strategy to yes. resurrecting certain people for the benefit of their memories, and that's gonna come up later in the episode. Meanwhile, Pop goes to the hospital and finds Nadia and finds out that Chris is dead. They immediately leave the hospital from there where they run into, dun dun dun, dun Chance on a motorcycle. And she tells them they gotta get the hell out of there. But they're coming, they're right down the road and they're killing everyone who's left. I think this is the beginning of the B movie. Yes, that's, I was just, I, I've been in, trying in, to say it for a while. In this episode. And in my, the back of my head, I'm like, okay, are we getting a B movie? Are we getting a B movie? And then when Chance shows up, I'm thinking, okay, this might be where we're going because she just pulls off the helmet and says, let's go. It's no time to explain. Just the right level of yes. corny. Yes. And I think they sell it. And then immediately in the next scene, what do we have? A shootout. Now they're getting chased around town by the goo cult. Yep. There's a shootout. It's looking grim. And then out of nowhere, Abdi just T-bones the car yep. and takes out the goo cult people. Now all the heroes are reunited. And the cherry on top comes when they all get inside the Emporium Galorium and Pop hits a switch and all of a sudden the barriers come down for the shutters and we're in. Boom, Robo Fortress. Let's live long enough to talk it out. Emporium Galorium Robo Fortium. <laughs> 
So quick thing, Abdi asked the question that everyone else is probably asking at home too, is why the hell weren't they affected by this? Why didn't they hear the sound? Yeah, I think we'll see some explanation or a better context for that. Yeah. Because on the surface, it looks like the short answer is uh, they're the main characters. From here, Pop's plan is to just dig in. Yes and fight out mm -hmm. the rest of this conflict. He breaks out of like 10 those? like pressure cooker IEDs basically. Yeah. And the plan is to wire the all of the entrances to the building mm -hmm. with those bombs so they can blow up anybody trying to get in. While taking one of the bombs down into the basement to sort of like the back basement door. Yeah. The bomb like breaks or malfunctions or whatever and Chance leaves it there presumably to go and get a replacement part you which think? doesn't doesn't happen. No. But what does happen is that Annie and a couple other survivors show up and break in through that back door. Hands up! Up, 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 up! Now the second Annie shows up, Chance and her spar a little bit and they're pointing fingers of like, who could be the one? They look like us. And immediately I'm thinking, oh, here we go. Here it is. Here Are comes, we doing the thing? Here comes the thing moment we've yes. been expecting all season. Yes. I don't know. Maybe that this wasn't even the plan at all, but I just felt in my gut at that point, I was like, they're going to do a blood test. They're going to do something here with the Haldol or those drugs, and they're going to start testing people. Yeah, but, they know about the drugs. Yeah, they know about the drugs. Uh, I thought it was just set up perfectly to do a thing moment. Instead, we get sort of an interview montage. Yes. It seems like kind of maybe the cheaper path um, Maybe. It doesn't hurt the episode that much, but it was definitely like, oh, we almost had it. We almost I had it. I feel like they, that was the plan. That was the plan going in with them. They're like, let's do it. Let's do the thing. And then last, they're like, mm, we can't do it. Not quite. And yeah. they would have injected each one of them. Waited for it to work. And then waited for it to work. And then like one one of them would have been like, hey! Oh. <laughs> now, my favorite part of this entire episode happens to be the little exchange we have with Pop and Annie. Pop asks Annie, how the hell did she get out of that whole thing experience earlier at the parade? I killed some people. How'd you get all the way over here? I killed some more people. The only thing that was missing from this episode was Emilio Estevez. Annie follows this up by mm -hmm. confessing to killing Ace and explaining the, the Marston house and the crypt. Mm -hmm. to fill Pop in a little bit further, which is just more confirmation of his fears and helps him to determine that she's on the level. So Pop figures out that Jamal is the mole out of the group after he checks his earlobe. Right, and it's healed, which is a sign that he's one of the resurrected people. Jamal goes after Pop, mm -hmm. but before he can take Pop out, Nadia rescues Pop, shoots Jamal, and wounds him. From there, Jamal wakes up, and uh, he tells them that no matter what happens, Amity will be returning tomorrow at dusk, apparently. Then the Beatles start Mm -hmm. showing up in Loved the Emporium, it. and it's like, you know, foreshadowing mm -hmm. that Augustine is coming, and, of course, Jamal announces to top that it that's off. the case. He's here. He's here. Like, almost like Barlow's arrived kind of thing. I love it. The offer's pretty simple. In exchange for the letters, mm -hmm. uh, everyone is free to go. Yeah. Give us a location of the devil, and uh, everything's fine from there, from there on out. You'll be okay. Seems like an easy deal to take, if you ask me. <laughs> Meanwhile, while all this is going on, Pop is getting worse. Yeah, he's just downhill the whole episode. Yeah. While these negotiations are going down, mm -hmm. Nadia finds the train schedule and remembers a game she and Abdi played when they were kids, mm -hmm. which had to do with beating the train. Ironically, the reason they had this game in the first place was to get away from Ace, so I thought that was cool. Yeah, that is a good touch, actually. Now, the earlier scene with Pop was your favorite scene uh -huh. in the episode. My favorite scene is what comes up next, when Annie sneaks into the room with Jamal. She's in there to get information from Jamal to find out where Joy is. Yes. And the first thing she goes for is the hammer. <sighs> And nice little touch. I think that's the like misery nod. Yeah. Like it looks like we are we this is this is definitely gonna turn into a torture scene if nobody shows up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they start off with threatening to go into a 
totally just straight play misery reference. I, I would have rolled my eyes if she pulled out an ax and tried to chop off his foot or something like also, that. Also, I just don't think that they wanted to go into a torture scene. And instead, though, we get some great moments of Lizzie Kaplan acting. Yeah. And then what fits this, like, B-movie-themed action episode, she doesn't get any information out of him. No. He, he's just, he's pushing the buttons. Yep. And he gets under her skin, and she just loses it. She just, she grabs the, the syringes and just stabs him in the eyes. <laughs> Not only does she stab him with the syringes, she squeezes down on them. <laughs> oh yeah. Last note to that scene, while Nadia and everybody is sort of like taking care of Annie. All the chaos is going like, on, yeah. Pop takes the opportunity to like snake away a few vials and syringes. Yes. So Pop returns to his office for a moment to talk to Ace on that walkie talkie one more time. As they're going back and forth, we get a few cuts to different things in the shop. One of those things happens to be in a little Easter egg for Sundog. We see that haunted Polaroid 660 camera. So he should have just handed that to Ace and said, here's a gift. You, you should take this, buddy. It's all good. So Pop tells Ace, who he calls Gus, Gus now. Yes. Gus, yes. And uh, he tells him that he burned the letters. He hasn't done it just yet, but he tells Ace that just for now. And Ace just tells him, hey, that's fine. We'll just uh, take you instead. Right here they are applying the strategy that they used with Martha. Mm -hmm. I think we always knew that they could probably do this or have that strategy, but this is the episode where they're like doing it. We also get a, I think, pretty poignant scene with Nadia and Pop. Mm -hmm. He's still trying to- Make peace. Make peace and she's not having any of it. Nope, nope. She tells him straight up, the second we get out of here, if I survive, I'm gonna forget about you and I'm never coming back to this town again. So Pop returns to his desk to get those letters and make good on his threat and actually burns all of Warden Lacey's letters. He then puts on a C4 vest, mm -hmm. of course, like you do, and tells Ace he's gonna blow himself up so he can't use his body. Ace does not like that plan. That's not a good plan as far as Ace is concerned. Now the siege begins. Yes. Ace has them pull all of the steel shutters off the first floor windows mm -hmm. and then they the, go in. The goo cult runs in and they all start getting blown up by the explosives. Out of all the melee that was going on, I, I had to take a moment, I hope everyone else did too while watching it, and just go, this is absurd that it's Annie Wilkes. Because watching Lizzie Kaplan's performance, who she's, she's just doing an amazing job, and seeing her doing the walk, trying to put in a gun, shooting people, and she's still in character. They're not vampire vampire things. The storyline itself is bonkers, and I absolutely love it. This is some real like Marvel style, yes. connected universe like imagining. Yeah. And it's really good. This, again, I will talk about it for season three, but I swear to God, I really want Johnny Smith and Christine next season driving that thing around and she's just controlling him. He's like, I know the future, let's go save everybody. <laughs> <laughs> In the ensuing fighting that happens mm -hmm. uh, after this, at one point Chance is attacked by Timothy and Timothy gets taken out by Annie. It's a little sad. That's like the official end to the Timothy. Stand by me, cross the thing, yeah. uh, hopes that we had. And I was actually just hoping that there would be more to the Timothy character with the kids, but uh, either way, it's still an exciting scene. Everybody reaches the basement uh -huh. to escape through the back, yep. but Pop holds back and locks the, himself back into the building. The Armageddon moment. Mm -hmm. Through the glass door. Yep. While the rest of the crew is trying to make their escape, Evelyn gets shot. We suspected early on that she might be a mole when she was talking to Nadia after she had screwed up the blood test. Right, I mean that was one of the like signifiers to us earlier in the season that they had been like converting lots of people in the town mm -hmm. was that shot yeah. of Evelyn in the hospital. So it totally leads to the possibility that when Annie came back to the Emporium Galorium, she was just with goo cult people. She wasn't like, there, I nobody that. Nobody was human. Yeah. And, and they, then, they caught one of them, but not both of them. And sadly, she got caught in the crossfire. Yeah. Meanwhile, Pop injects himself with all of the Haldol that he has. Yes. 
Don't forget that. And then goes on a like kill crazy rampage mm -hmm. against the goo cult. And finally, Pop and Ace see each other eye to eye here. Ace is the first time he's actually like, oh, okay, hold on, wait a second, let's talk this out. Right, uh, Pop basically has the trigger in his hand mm -hmm. to set off his bombs. He's just gotta click the battery into place. And he does it. Yeah, he's ready to go. After the conversation he had with Nadia and Abdi, He's ready, it's time. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Caveat emptor. No deal. No! Now, while this is all going on, the rest of the crew, they made it out safely. They get past the train tracks, which is a little standby me nod. Pop decides this is it for him, so he sits down on that chair one last time, pulls out the pipe, smokes for a second, and then Ace takes him out. Before we get into our final questions and theories leading to the final episode of this season, make sure to leave your thoughts about the plot so far in the comments below and hit that subscribe button. First up, I wanna talk about the kid and Henry Deaver and I don't actually think this is gonna get resolved, but we gotta talk about it. This season's plot involving the kid, Warden Lacey, and Alan Pangborn has very loose and sketchy ties to season one. Up to this point, we have been presuming that Henry Deaver and the kid both disappeared from Shawshank at about the same time, either together or separately. Besides the assumption that someone has to take care of the kid in the cage, we have heard and seen nothing about Deaver. This raises two questions. Will Deaver be back? And does he even exist in this version of Castle Rock? The return of Warden Lacey's wife and the importance placed on his letters to Alan Pangborn seem an odd emphasis given the material mystery of two men missing and apparently vanished. If this were the same timeline as season one, how would correspondence between either men with anyone, let alone each other, be useful to a 400-year-old goo cult given that both were dead long before the kid was captured and reincarcerated by Henry Deaver? I don't feel like we're gonna get any more filling in with the Henry Deaver absence. Not yet. Unless there is another kind of sick plot twist in the finale, but it feels like right now, that's out. It maybe just didn't even happen, not in this timeline. Dovetailing off of that, we still don't have a solid handle for the real endgame of the goo cult led by the kid. It's looking like resurrecting Amity and Joy's body and bringing back the kid slash angel, probably at Castle Lake, are where we're going. It's not clear what that will achieve, but it's definitely what has to be stopped. Another piece of the finale puzzle is then how Pop plays in. He will likely provide whatever the sought-after information is that Gus needs from his head, but will he be saved by Nadia? We know the show is foreshadowing that moment now that we know the effects of the Haldol are temporary. It is highly likely that Nadia brings back Pop long enough to forgive him. Another possibility, too, is that taking all the drugs in the advance of becoming part of the goo cult, mm. Pop knows about the crypt. Mm -hmm. He's actually planning on being resurrected in the crypt and just burning it out from the inside. Yeah, they bring up the line about the caskets in this episode, as well as you see him inject himself with the Haldol beforehand. So it seems like he's gonna wake up, but he's still gonna be himself, just like we saw a few episodes back when someone broke out of that crypt and ran out of there. Now, I think that's a call for this later on. Also, if that's the case, then that means that the failed suicide vest was part of the long con. <laughs> that he Ooh. wasn't actually planning on blowing himself up. In that moment, he learned that Ace was freaked out by the possibility of getting blown up, and he knew- He could take everyone out. That he could take everyone out. Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about vampires. Now, we've subtly and not so subtly circled around calling the goo cult a group of vampires. Obviously, they're not vampires in the traditional sense, but that doesn't mean they can't go out like vampires in the modern sense. Episode nine, if not referential to anything outside of King Lore, was at least a nod to John Carpenter's Assault on Precinct 13, where a decommissioned police station is laid siege by gang members bent on revenge. In that film, the protagonists need to outsmart the horde of gang members that seem very zombie-like by the conclusion. If this reference is accurate, then maybe the resolution in the finale will be reminiscent of John Carpenter's Vampires. In that film, a ragtag and depleted team of vampire hunters must raid a vampire hideout for a final battle before a ritual can take place that will allow the vampires to survive in the sun. I feel like that could happen here too. Nadia, Abdi, Annie, and Chance will have to take down the goo cult and destroy the Marson house once and for all. Given how well executed the takeover of Castle Rock and Salem's Lot has been over the last few episodes, I definitely anticipate an exciting conclusion mm -hmm. to this series. At least one more cool action scene, another great moment of Lizzie Kaplan as Annie Wilkes, mm -hmm. and at least 
one more plot twist that we don't see coming. Let us know down in the comments what you think is going to happen in the finale of Castle Rock Season 2. And we will see you all back here for the finale. Bye-bye.